So I always think it's important to start out with a good intention for our time together. And because it is a busy season of life and a busy time of the year, I bet that many of you probably are feeling stress and kind of the wind down to summer and kind of the ramping back up to back to school. And if you're not feeling it right now, you might be feeling it soon. So um, just want you to feel encouraged to take this next hour that we have together and really focus in on yourself and kind of your goals and intentions for signing up for this webinar. And we're going to talk about resilience, but we're also going to talk about stress and coping. So this is the road to resilience, becoming your best self. And I am Abby Horton. I am a registered nurse. I am a certified health and life coach, a wellness class ambassador and wellness class educator. And I'm so happy to be with y'all today. If there's anything I can ever do for you or if I can answer any questions after the presentation's over, I'm more than happy to do that. My contact information is here and it's abby.horton at ua.edu. So please feel free to reach out. Our webinar goals for today, we really just want to talk about resilience, what that is, what it means, how it can help us manage stress in uncertain times, how we can explore self-care and the importance of self-care, and how we can learn specific strategies to develop and support positive coping strategies that really are going to help foster resilience. So I always like to start these types of presentations with a disclaimer that if you are feeling sad, angry, overwhelmed, or not yourself, if you're using unhealthy coping mechanisms or perhaps the coping mechanisms that you've used in the past aren't helping you, uh, if you've lost someone or something, you know, if you're grieving, if you've experienced a trauma or major life event, or if you've just stopped doing things that you normally enjoy and your past coping strategies are not helping you right now, I'd love to encourage you to reach out and seek some professional help and we can certainly help you uh, make those connections. We have a lot of great resources here at UA as part of our employment benefits. So how to seek help, there's lots of information both nationally and then here locally on campus and in the wider West Alabama community, but here are some resources here for you and a lot of great resources on our website at wellness.ua.edu. So when I think about resilience, I often think about stress and coping because resilience usually is something that we don't give a lot of thought to unless we are in a period where we do feel a lot of stress and we question how, how resilient we are. I don't know if that resonates for you, but that's certainly when I think of resilience. Uh, part of my professional background as a nurse educator and researcher is to look at the impact of stress and coping on not only nurses, but patients and students. And so we talk a lot about stress when we talk about resilience. And so really when we think about controlling what we can control and focusing on what's important, I want to really leave you with these four images. And I pulled these and made it into one slide for you because it's a good way to refocus yourself when you're feeling stressed or overwhelmed. So the goal of, you know, having, you know, negative thoughts and feelings and stress, it's not to get rid of that completely. Um, you know, it's not to just completely, you know, deny those parts of yourselves because we are going to have negative thoughts. We are going to have ne negative feelings from time to time. We are going to have stress. It's just a part of being human. And so that really is an impossible goal if that's your goal. But it's the goal of this presentation and of the work that I do to help Help you really change your response to those negative thoughts, those negative feelings or situations and that stress that you may have because stress is a part of the human experience and feeling lots of, you know, different types of emotions are part of the human experience. Right now, you know, I think a lot of our, our discussions are about, you know, being positive all the time and I think that's so important, but it needs to come from an authentic place. And um, this messaging that we're getting about toxic, you know, positivity, um, you know, it's really rooted in, you know, this positive vibes only uh, mentality that we're seeing in social media and just on coffee mugs, everywhere you turn, it's positive vibes only. And for me, I think that really denies what it means to be a human because 
we are going to have those days where we don't feel so positive and that's okay. It's how we respond to that that really matters. So don't worry about what you can't control. Really focus on what it is that you can control. And there's a lot of things that we can control. We can control our attitude, our actions, our behavior. We can control what we consume. And that can be food. That can be, you know, social media. That can be mainstream media. That can be who we tune into um, in terms of our friend group, who we follow and unfollow, how we choose to react to certain situations is that's really critical. The personal boundaries that we set and then how we speak to ourselves, how we speak to others and how we think about ourselves and others. Those are all the important things that we can control when it feels like so much of what we experience day to day is not within our, in our control. And that's true. So this last image is a Venn diagram. I don't know about you, but I do love a good Venn diagram. And it's important because it talks about what's important, what matters, and what you can control. And where the things that matter and the things that you can control overlap, that's where your attention should be. So there are things that matter that we can't control, and there are things that we can control that really in the grand scheme of things don't matter. But if it matters, and we can have some control over it, that's where we really should focus our time and our energy and our efforts, okay? So I hope that sets the stage for our talk today. And stress really has a lot of definitions. You know, we could get very technical, we could get very medical with this, but for me, stress really comes down to the fact that you have a mental and physical load that you don't necessarily have the, the tools or the resources to actually manage it well. So it's you know, really feeling overwhelmed or overcome by the demands or pressures of a certain situation or season of life and not feeling like you have the tools and resources needed to actually overcome that and, and to really um, manage that well. And so that is the simple definition of stress that we're going to use to work with today. You know, more technically speaking, stress is the body's automatic response to any physical or mental demand that's placed on it. And when we do feel stressed, we have a rush of adrenaline and cortisol, which are going to be really hormonal responses to stress. And that can send us into what we always talk about as fight or flight mode. But what we don't talk about is we don't talk about the freeze mode that we sometimes find ourselves in. So when you hear about fight or flight, you probably have heard the story about the saber toothed tiger, uh, you know, during prehistoric days where, you know, a person encountered a saber toothed tiger and that was their source of stress. And they either, you know, faced the tiger and fought the tiger away, you know, that embodiment of stress, or we ran away, you know, we were fleeing the stress. Um, and so that's really what we think about. Either we face it and fight it or we, we flee. But we have many other responses and there were too many to list here. There are nine to 12 responses that you could talk about in terms of stress. But the one that I see the most um, not only professionally, but personally, is people freezing. We are so overwhelmed with information that we have. Uh, you know, we have endless sources of information today. Um, we are bombarded by a lot of, you know, good and happy things on social media, but also a lot of, um, you know, concerning news that we can have access to 24-7 all the way around the world. Um, we've all, you know, lived through um, this, you know, pandemic with COVID-19 and then our everyday stressors haven't stopped just because those kinds of things have been going on as well. So add in your workload and your everyday responsibilities and stressors and you can really have a situation that feels like you can't overcome it. So I see people really freezing. When you hear someone that says that they're you know, feeling overwhelmed or stuck, or they just don't know what to do, they're probably in that freeze mode of a stress response. And so I will tell you my secret that I have found has been really impactful, but just want to mention that stress can be positive and negative. It can have both positive and negative effects, but stress really can be neutral if we choose to view it that way. And stress can even be viewed as necessary because we know as humans, we need a certain level of stress, of challenge to keep us engaged and to keep us feeling like we have meaning and purpose. 
And some of us are more motivated in that sense than others, but it's a basic human need. So when we don't have stress, we often find ourselves not performing to the best of our abilities. And we also find ourselves maybe even bored. And so we see that with kids during the summer sometimes, you know, we're, we're larger, you know, older versions of kids and um, we can get that way too. So just try to think about stress as being neutral and necessary instead of it being something that's really overtly bad because it isn't. Moderate levels of stress actually improve performance. Um, depending on your mindset and, and how you go about managing your stress, it really can be a performance enhancer and it can improve your efficiency. So try to use stress as a good way to, you know, reassess and reflect on your life and see what holds true for you. Uh, managing stress may also help foster resilience. So there are a lot of theories on the educational medical side of resilience and what resilience means and how it's defined. But what I want to do is just really talk about resilience as, as the way that we talk about it in casual conversation. And it's just the ability to keep on going when you've faced a lot of challenges. And that's what we all want to be able to do well, is to show up well in our lives, both professionally and personally, and overcome those obstacles and everyday stressors as best as we can. I think that's probably a, a common goal for us. And so when you think about overcoming um, that stress, you're really building resilience. So without having challenges, without having stressors, uh, resilience is like a muscle, and if we don't have to use that muscle, it's not going to develop. And so resilience really does, whether you started out with a lot of resilience, you know, genetically um, and environmentally, you grew up in a household that helped foster resilience, um, or whether you're having to develop that, you know, in light of the last 18 months that we've all been collectively, you know, kind of going through together, Resilience, you have to have some stress, you have to have some challenge to really see that develop to the level that we want. So um, that's another way that you can view stress as a positive thing in your life. So we want to try to get away from moralizing things. You know, we moralize a lot of things in our lives so that they're, it's either good or bad or good or evil. And we really want to get away from that because most things are just necessary and most things can just be viewed as neutral. And my secret for getting unstuck when you're overwhelmed or you're having a freeze response is really to take action. And in the moment, particularly if you have any kind of anxious thoughts or feelings or have some anxiety when you are managing your stress response, if you will get up from wherever you are, get up from your bed, your chair, uh, even if you're just standing still, if you will walk somewhere else and just get your body moving, that is the best way to get unstuck and to get some of those feelings of anxiousness um, to subside. And it doesn't have to be that you go and exercise, although that would be great as well. It really can be that you just move your location, move your body, because that's what's really needed when you think about having to take action. And when you take action, that's your body's way of developing that good motivation. That's your body's way of actually responding well to your stress. And you can develop those types of coping mechanisms uh, by just practicing it. And I know that that sounds simple. It may even sound a little, little silly, but that's what's so important about the way our bodies are designed. Exercise, purposeful movement, those are all ways to get really rid of that adrenaline and that cortisol and those extra things that come on board to try to help our body prepare for the stress. Uh, because our body, our system, our neurological system hasn't really advanced to the level that our world has advanced in terms of, you know, when we go to take a test as students or we go in for, a, you know, an important meeting with someone at work, our bodies can't differentiate that meeting or that test from the saber tooth tiger in prehistoric days. And so our body sends adrenaline and cortisol and this hormonal cascade to prepare us for our impending stress, which, which mostly in prehistoric days were really physical stressors. And now we have more mental stressors. And so by exercising, by moving, by meditating, by just changing our scenery around us, um, and taking action, we can really start to get unstuck and get those chemicals out of our bodies. So I hope that that is helpful. It took me a little bit of research and some trial and error to come up with that 
uh, technique and it really is personally helpful and has been helpful to many people that I've shared it with. So definitely try it. If you get an email this afternoon that stresses you out, close your email, walk out of your office or wherever you are, you know, just put your phone away or put your computer, you know, in, in sleep mode and just take a walk and see if that doesn't help you. So some stressors that we can have, you know, there's transition to everything being online, there's family relationships, there's been social distancing, and now, you know, we are in that period of time where uh, we're seeing some, you know, COVID numbers increase, so that may be a concern for you. Um, we've experienced business and school closures this past year, maybe financial concerns, employment concerns, housing concerns, uh, maybe, you know, graduate school concerns, if any of you have I uh, thought about going back to school. Certainly there have been a lot of caregiving responsibilities and parenting responsibilities that have increased this past year. And just maintaining relationships and a sense of normalcy. Of course, you could have had health or illness concerns related or not related to COVID-19. And then just overall feelings of uncertainty. And certainly we've had a lot this past year um, beyond COVID in terms of just things going on in our world that um, have caused some uncertainty and some chaos for, for some people. Um, and we may have been personally impacted or we may just be having empathy for those events. And so those are continuing to cause stressors in our lives. And we have to really think about how do we want to work toward managing those stressors. So for every stressor that you have, you have a trigger. And you may not think about it, but you know, for me, I love giving this example because I have young children at home that are school aged. Uh, at dinner time, you know, dinner time can be a very stressful, uh, you know, time of the day. You're tired from school and work. Um, if you have children or you know, pets or plants or people that you're responsible for, it can be a busy time because you're just coming in from work. Uh, and you know, you can have these triggers that you don't even realize. And so things could be going well. I'll give an example from my life. You know, maybe I'm getting home from work this evening, trying to get dinner on the table and maybe someone drops their, you know, plate of feed. Maybe a child drops their plate of feed. Maybe the doorbell rings. Doesn't that always happen when you're trying to get dinner on the table? Or maybe your dog barks. That always happens to me. And the trigger is that you're already stressed and tired and you were managing it okay until the plate fell. You know, maybe the food went everywhere, maybe the plate broke. And then you just kind of add on to that stress with the dog barking, the phone ringing, the doorbell ringing, and then just the general chaos of getting the, you know, the food and the plate cleaned up. So the trigger really there was that you, you know, had something that happened and that triggered the stressor that you had. And this may be something that happens every once in a while, or it may be that you have this kind of episode every time you're putting dinner on the table. And so for those triggers and stressors that occur on a daily or weekly basis, those are the ones that we want to focus on. Um, you know, the email that comes, you know, once a semester or once a year that gets you a little, you know, off kilter and you just feel a little upset or anxious, you know, maybe you just have to take a walk around the office and, and get back to your, to your work. You know, maybe that's not something you can avoid or manage or limit. But those that we regularly encounter, you know, running out of gas on your way to work or not buying groceries in time to get your meals prepped for the week or, um, you know, having that dinner time situation. Those are the kinds of stressors and triggers that we can work toward avoiding or limiting so that we can live a more stress-free life. And so we also want to explore in relation to this self-care and stress management strategies because we know that we need good coping mechanisms for this and we know that the elimination of stress is not possible. Um, you know, we talk about stress as if we shouldn't have any, as if we should just be at zero level of stress. And if you are a human on this webinar today, I'm sure that you have encountered something stressful today. And, and likely will before we're even done with this call. And that's, that's typical, that's okay. But it's how you're going to actually respond that's important. So decide in advance how you're going to respond. If you know that it's likely that the dog's gonna bark, the phone's gonna ring, and the doorbell's gonna ring, and maybe a kid's gonna drop your, you know, a plate of food at dinner tonight, go ahead and think about how am I gonna respond in that moment? 
because when we have an overreaction to that, we really are then stressed and making ourselves even more fatigued because we're just getting to that exhaustion burnout level of stress. And many of us may have experienced that this past year. So try to write down three to five of your most common triggers and stressors and see what you can do this week, um, particularly this weekend. Think about this next week as you're planning, uh, you know, finishing out uh, the rest of July. How do you really want to show up for the rest of your summer? And how can you start to manage some of those stressors? So we know that when we manage our stress well, that we have both physical and mental effects. So we have more energy and stamina. We have a better attitude, a more positive attitude. We might feel more hopeful or we might even be happier. We're able to focus better. So we're able to actually learn and achieve and meet the, the goals that we've set for ourselves. We can build skills and confidence that leads to self-trust. And we really do foster that resilience or that ability to kind of bounce back through challenges. And so I want to talk of just a minute about self-trust. Every time we break our promise to ourselves, we break our, our trust in ourselves. And I don't think that we think about that nearly enough. So when we tell someone that we're going to work out and or we tell ourselves, we put it on our calendar, we're going to work out and we don't work out. We've all done that, right? <laughs> uh, when we say that we're going to call someone back and we don't, when we say that we're going to show up to work at this certain time and we don't, when we promise our kids that we're going to play a video game for, you know, the, the millionth time that week and we don't. All of those things, um, you know, are important to think about because it erodes our self-trust because our brain is always listening and it's always saying, you know, she told me that she was going to eat breakfast this morning and she didn't. She told me that she was going to play that video game last night and she didn't. She told me that she was going to work out this week and she hasn't. So I don't know if I can trust that she's going to do what she says she's going to do. And so that erosion of self-trust is why we sometimes get stuck, sometimes when we feel unmotivated. And it's oftentimes why we don't develop those good habits that lead to better stress management and better resilience. So start keeping keeping your promises to yourselves. Uh, I know that you probably keep your promises to other people. A lot of us really have that drive to people please or to meet external expectations. There's some consequences usually built in if we don't. Uh, but a lot of times we don't put consequences on ourselves for not keeping our promises to, to the ourselves and to the loved ones that we're most close to. Um, it's easy to, you know, to not take those as seriously or to follow up on them because um, it just is something that we get in the habit of doing. And so keep your promises, but most importantly, keep your promises to yourself. And you're going to see that that's going to impact how you show up in your life, how you manage your stress and how resilient you become. And I can say that for someone who has gone through a lot of life. I've had a lot of uh, life experiences that have taught me the importance of keeping those promises to myself. So how well do you bounce back after challenges? I want y'all to think about that. So resilience is really the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. And this is the American Psychological Association's definition of resilience. And so what does that have to do with our health? Well, when we have a lack of resilience, when we have a lot of stress that we're having difficulty managing, then our health, both physical and mental, can be impacted, and even our overall well-being. And so health is really more than the absence of disease, and I think that's important to say as many times as we can. Uh, just because you're a healthy weight, just because you're a healthy BMI, just because you don't have a diagnosis or a prescription does not mean that you're truly meeting the definition of holistic health. And so we want a state of being that people define in relation to their own values, personality, and lifestyle. So what does health mean to you? Uh, for me, health means that I'm able to show up well at home and at work, and that I'm able to play with my kids at home, that I'm able to be a really active and, and engaged mom. And for me at work, it means that I can meet my you know, workload and my schedule with a lot of good energy and showing up well for that. And there are times where we realize we need a little extra rest. Uh, rest can be very productive. And so I would encourage you that if you're feeling 
discouraged or burn out or you're feeling like you're a little overwhelmed or stuck, it may be that you just need to take some time to really productively rest and intentionally rest. So the lifestyle impact on health. We probably all have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and I really do love this pyramid. I am a big fan of graphics and images. And Maslow tells us that we have to get our basic needs met before we can get our higher order needs met. And so our basic needs are things like food and water and warmth and rest. Um, you know, all of those basic things like clothing and shelter, even intimacy. Um, uh, you know, those are all basic physiological needs. Um, so safety needs then are also the next priority. So making sure that you're, you feel safe and secure. Those are your basic needs. And then your psychological needs are really your belongingness and your love. So having those good relationships and friendships and, and family uh, dynamics in place and having good personal self-esteem. So feeling accomplishment, feeling meaning are gonna be a part of those psychological needs. And then as you move up the pyramid, once those needs are met, then you can reach self-actualization or self-fulfillment, you know, achieving your full potential, including all of the creative things and the goals that you wanna meet. And so what I see a lot of people do, especially at the beginning of the new year, or because we sometimes live our lives in semesters, we start out really strong and we're like, we're going to meet all of these new goals and we're going to get on that weight loss plan or a fitness plan and we're going to exercise. We create all of these goals and those are great goals to have, but we get discouraged and we can't keep them because we haven't developed habits that are helpful and, and healthy. We haven't developed discipline that we need to actually implement those habits. And a lot of times we haven't met our basic needs. And so if we haven't met those basic needs, it's going to be difficult for us to really impact our overall health and well-being and manage our stress well. So our you know, lives are really impacted by the way that we think. And those thoughts really drive our feelings and our actions. And so health beliefs are really important because they can have a positive or negative influence. If you don't think that you can lose weight, you're probably not going to lose weight. If you don't think that you can get fit, you're probably not going to get fit because you're not going to take the actions that are needed to get fit. And so we know that, but sometimes we just need reminding. And I need reminding. This is for me too. So health beliefs and practices, again, are influenced by internal and external variables. So things in our environment, but they'll say things that are internal. And so our needs really drive our approach to health and wellness. And that's where this hierarchy of needs comes in. So what do we need at a basic level? That's going to help us know what we need to do for our stress and coping and for our health and wellness plan. So I hope that that's helpful. I don't want to get too technical, but I do think it's important that we understand the root causes of some of the things we're managing when we think about stress and resilience. So resilience and health have an important relationship and we know that one impacts the other. So if our health is, is really giving us challenges, it's going to take a hit on our resilience. And if we don't have a lot of resilience to start with and then we have some health challenges, then that's going to impact it. So we really got to take back control and really start to do what we know we can do. Um, and there are going to be things that you can't control that maybe your neighbor or your coworker can, and that's okay. It, again, is a part of the human experience. We're not, you know, cookie cutter copies of each other, and our lives look very different. So importance here is uh, really focusing on acknowledging your feelings and knowing that it's okay to feel whatever feelings you're having. It's okay to feel anxious sometimes. It's okay to feel stressed sometimes. Um, you know, but you need to reach out if that's continuing on for a long period of time. You know, maybe you need to take breaks from the news. Maybe you need to take breaks from social media. Maybe you don't need to be in your neighborhood, um, you know, Facebook group right now. Um, maybe you need to offset some of the stress with things that bring you joy and that are calming activities. Uh, you know, cultivating a sense of hopefulness and optimism is really important. Research has shown that that is an, an important component to feeling healthy and feeling like you have a good level of wellness. And then planning and preparing for the unexpected is really important. So if you treat everything in your life like it's an emergency or unexpected, like, you know, oh, 
I'm out of gas again, or, oh, I'm out of laundry, you know, clean laundry this week, or, oh, I forgot to go to the grocery store. You know, we sometimes have seasons where we live in survival mode, and then we need a wake-up call to remind us that it's time to get out of survival mode. And so if you can plan and prepare for your week and for the unexpected, uh, you know, and do it to a healthy level, you know, not a level where it causes you even more stress or anxiety. But if you can plan and prepare, that's going to help your brain take a break. And we all need brain breaks. Our brain is really designed to help us protect ourselves, to help us, you know, recognize patterns so we can avoid danger. And it really wants to keep us safe. It's the, the main goal of the brain is to keep us alive and safe and working. And so if we get into this situation where um, we always have these external stressors in the form of not having groceries or gas or clean clothes to wear, our brain is constantly going to be kind of trying to make up for that. And so we're taking away our brain power, we're consuming a lot of our calories the brain takes about a fifth of our daily calories just to operate, even though it's not very heavy or, or very big, it consumes a lot of our energy in the form of calories. And it gets really difficult to stay focused and concentrate when we're always trying to get out of survival mode. And so I'd really encourage you to try to be as organized and prepared as you can for your life, because then when you do have things that you can't control, it's not gonna feel quite as overwhelming. So some positive reframing. I went through several years of trainings and then actually did my health and life coaching certification and joined another program to really improve my skills as a life and health coach before I came across this positive reframing tool. And so I share that with you to say it has been a huge blessing and an, an important part of my journey um, as I've been working on my health and fitness the last three years. And it was something that did not come easy. I did not get this, uh, you know, at the beginning of my journey. And so I'm really hoping this helps you. It seems really simple, maybe even silly, but it's very, very effective. And it's almost so simple that you might not try it. So I would encourage you, if you try nothing else, try this positive reframing. So we have circumstances, thoughts, feelings, and actions and results. And so this is called a, a health coach or a coaching model. And we know it as positive reframing. You will hear people say, well, just be positive. That's what I hear a lot when we have people who are stressed. They'll say, well, my so-and-so said, well, if I'll just think positive thoughts or if I'll just, you know, be more positive. And y'all, if we knew how to do that instinctively, we would all be more positive. We would never have negative thoughts because no one wakes up wanting to feel stressed or to have negative thoughts, I don't think. <laughs> and so, but it's not that easy. Like, how do we have more positive thoughts? That's where it's really practical and where I get passionate. So our circumstances, I just made this up, but fill in the blank for you. Maybe jot this on a piece of paper. I'm trying to work in the middle of a pandemic, or you might be, we're kind of moving into hopefully a post pandemic world. I'm trying to work and get back to some normalcy in a post pandemic world. Fill in the blank for you. I'm trying to raise a teenager and work full time, or I'm trying to work full time and go to graduate school. Fill in your circumstance that's bothering you the most. And then think about it. Like, what is your thought that you have about it? And I'll tell you, mine is, oh, this is so hard. My life is so hard. This is so overwhelming. I'm so stressed. And that thought, when you say it over and over, you're telling your brain over and over again, my life is so hard. I'm so stressed. Then you start to feel overwhelmed and, you know, maybe a whole other host of emotions, but they're not happy emotions. They're not positive emotions usually. And then the action that you take when you feel overwhelmed is what? We binge eat, we watch Netflix, or we watch TikTok or Instagram, we scroll social media, um, we sit on the couch a lot, maybe we put our pajamas on as soon as we get home, and we just don't take action, right? We just, there's, we just feel stuck and overwhelmed. 
And then the result is that life is stressful because if you get in that stuck survival mode of, you know, kind of checking out or disengaging or scrolling social media a lot, and we all do this, right? Um, then life is stressful because we're not doing the things that we know we need to do. So we need to retrain our thoughts. And so a new, more helpful thought would be, I am strong. You might even say I'm strong and capable and I can change things if I want to. Okay. So let's change our thoughts by changing, um, this, you know, this dialogue that essentially we're having every day and probably don't even realize it. So the circumstance is, I'm trying to work in the middle of a pandemic. So the circumstance did not change. And that is so important because again, we usually can't change the circumstance. Um, when we're thinking about what we can control, the circumstance is usually not what we can control. And so when you think about the thought, if you say, I'm strong and I can change things if I want, instead of saying my life is so hard, that's the biggest difference. It's the thought. And then the thought drives that feeling of feeling more hopeful and optimistic. And when you feel more hopeful and optimistic, you get to work, you, you meet the friends for coffee, you go exercise, you get your to-do list done. And then the result is that things do start to change because you've taken positive action. So kind of going back to what I said at the beginning, action is really what starts driving your motivation. Motivation will often come after you've taken action, but motivation does not need to be what you try to hang on to because motivation is fleeting. Motivation is going to change like the weather changes, um, but discipline and habit and positive reframing is here to stay if you develop that. And that's what fosters our resilience, okay? I hope that that's as impactful for you as it has been for me and many of the life coaches that I work with and, and life coach clients. Um, journaling is a really helpful tool for self-reflection. And so I would encourage you to write down your circumstances and actually write out the acronym, the C-T-F-A-R, write that out. And every time you have a negative thought, work through this model like I just worked through with you. And eventually you'll start to see that your thoughts do change. And so what I wanna point out here is y'all, when y'all get that email this afternoon that stresses you out, or probably tomorrow afternoon when it's a Friday, and you get that email that's going to stress you out, and you're not automatically tomorrow because you heard this webinar are going to be like, you know what, she was right. I'm just going to say that I'm strong and I'm capable and I can change things if I want, and I don't have any negative thoughts about that. Y'all, we are human, and that is not how we work. Um, you're probably going to be like, oh, this is so hard. Of course, this happened on a Friday. But then if you just kind of snap your fingers or you get up from your desk and you say, you know what, though, it, 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 this is hard and I don't like this, but I am strong and I am capable and I can change this or I can control my response to this. I can't control the situation, but I can control the response. You will see a shift, right? So you're not automatically going to replace all those negative thoughts, but you're going to self-coach yourself into not thinking and dwelling on those negative thoughts. So some things about COVID, again, I put this here because I know that there are some increased concerns with the Delta strain of COVID. And so focusing on what you can control, again, acknowledging your thoughts and feelings, coming back into your body. A lot of times we disassociate when we're trying to cope with stress, um, meaning that we just kind of disengage and check out. We're really disassociating sometimes when we're scrolling social media or um, we're using other forms of self-medication. Really engage in what you're doing. I tell people all the time because I need to hear it, be where your feet are. Um, so don't be where you need to be in an hour from now, but be where your feet are. And, and right now you're here in this webinar. So try to be here in the, in the present moment. And that really helps with managing stress. Really, you know, be committed to committed action, opening up, you know, sharing your feelings, sharing your experiences, sharing your story. That's so important. We don't listen to people's stories nearly enough. Um, values, identifying resources, and really then very specific to COVID, you know, disinfecting and distancing as appropriate. But I'm hopeful that we are going to really, um, you know, push through this time and, and see a return to kind of our normalcy that we've been waiting for. And here are some more resources here. Again, taking care of your physical self, you know, putting your oxygen mask on first is so important. 
And um, these are some more tips to try to maintain normalcy. So things that you can control, you know, milestones and celebrations and self-care, those are the kinds of things you really want to focus on. And then, of course, staying connected is just so important. And I think we needed this reminder even before COVID. A lot of times we think that we're keeping up with people and that we're staying in touch because text messaging and Facebook and things make us feel like we're staying in touch. But I do think that we're the most disconnected that we've ever been in some ways because we have the false sense that we're staying connected. And research has shown that we feel even before COVID, the most isolated and lonely as we've ever felt as an adult cohort in the U.S. And so I think that's important. You know, getting back to basics, getting back to a simpler way of life, I think is something that we could all really benefit from. At least, you know, unplugging to really connect again is important and scheduling that into our calendars. So this is your permission slip to really put yourself and your help first, to say no when you need to say no, to ask for help, and to carve out time for things that make you feel good and that help your overall health and well-being. And so some coping strategies that you can use, again, setting realistic expectations, really pressing pause to reset and rest, uh, making things manageable. A lot of times we have to-do lists that are more like miniature projects. And so really taking time to break down your projects into smaller tasks that feel more manageable, uh, you know, avoiding procrastination and really setting those healthy boundaries, really focusing in on your values and your beliefs and trying to live those values out, you know, not compromising that, um, you know, scheduling time for self-care, listening to music, getting outside is really important. I think doing yoga outside uh, is one of the best things you can do because it's like mindfulness, meditation, and movement in nature all combined into one activity, and that's really, really helpful. Finding a hobby or rediscovering a hobby is important because we all need a creative outlet. You know, taking time for, you know, a few more minutes in the bath or shower, finding time for what makes you feel joy and, you know, clearing out your clutter. You know, our spaces usually reflect our, our mental state. And so um, taking some time to clean up your desk or your home or your office or your even your, your phone can be really helpful. I try to do that every Friday afternoon. It's not always perfect, but I try to schedule a few minutes to do that so that I'm well prepared for the next week. Uh, and then asking for help when you need it. You know, you have permission. If you need permission to ask for help, then you have it. Really checking your schedule. You know, sometimes we really get focused on trying to do better or trying to do more. And I would really encourage you to look at your schedule and responsibilities and see if what you're being asked to do is reasonable. You know, maybe you've taken on too much. Uh, maybe you feel like you can't say no and you can. Um, creating routines and rhythms and not just saying no, but, you know, being sure that you're saying yes when it really is a is a 100% yes is important. You know, picking your best yeses because for everything you say yes to, you're really saying no to something else. Um, when you say yes to volunteering, uh, you know, for something at your child's school or maybe something in the community, then you're saying no to something else. Maybe it's self-care or time with your family or friends. So, um, just always think about that. Setting is a time to reflect and to plan using positive affirmations, uh, you know, meditation, journaling, developing a gratitude practice. Research has shown that it's hard to be stressed when you're feeling grateful. It's almost impossible. So really thinking about things that you can be grateful for, engaging and being present in the moment where your feet are, uh, reframing your negative thoughts, connecting with your family and friends, unplugging, and really scheduling that time in, and then even stretching or walking or just some, you know, purposeful movement. It could be a dance party in your kitchen. I always like to tell people about the wellness basics, and I really call those the five to thrive, and it's a way to take care of yourself any day of the year, it, whether you're stressed or not, sleeping well, making sure you're getting seven to eight hours of sleep at night in a cool, quiet, dark room, uh, staying hydrated, drinking about half of your body weight in ounces a day. So usually more than 64 is needed to stay hydrated. 
striving for a healthy plate, you know, eating about half of your plate in vegetables and eating the rainbow. So not just beige and brown and green food, but reds and oranges and purples and blues and all of those great colors. Because for every color that you're eating or not eating, you're missing out on important nutrients, uh, you know, antioxidants, minerals, vitamins, and things like that. So move your body every day and then meditate for three to five minutes. And that could just be you sitting in your car before you go into work or home and just listening to a favorite song. It doesn't have to be the image of us, you know, sitting crisscross applesauce on the floor and trying to be devoid of all thought. It doesn't have to be that. It can be something very simple. It can even be a meditation app that you download on your phone. It doesn't have to be complicated. Sometimes we procrastinate, especially if we're perfectionistic. We procrastinate by trying to make things more complicated than they are. So do the simplest version of these wellness basics and you're going to see a huge improvement in your overall health and well-being. I have some more things here, again, just for sleep. Try to be in bed by 10, have an evening routine, try to limit your blue light exposure. And again, your room needs to be cool, dark, and quiet to really get the best sleep. We always focus on the number of hours of sleep, but I find that the quality of your sleep is almost more important, at least for me, than the number of hours that I sleep. Hydration, here's some tips to just set a goal to track it, habit stack. So maybe if you don't like to drink water or you forget, carry your water bottle with you. And then when you sit down at your desk for a webinar like this, or maybe you go watch TV at night and there's a commercial or ad break, um, you know, refill your water. I always like to make it fun and add, you know, herbs and fresh fruit because water is not my favorite. I like a lot of flavor and, and water does not have a lot of flavor to me. So you need to make it fun. Really, again, nourishing your body is so important. You know, we aren't just what we eat. We say that, but we are actually what we eat and digest and absorb. And so we want to make sure that we have really good gut health, that we are, you know, having a protein, a complex carbohydrate, and a healthy fat at every meal if we can, because that's going to help stabilize your blood sugars, that you're really tracking your meals and snacks, and particularly if you're trying to meet a health or wellness goal or fitness goal. And then really focusing on making one change at a time because small progress is still progress and it adds up over time. It's also going to be more sustainable if you do things slowly and um, don't overwhelm your, your lifestyle changes. Uh, you want to move every day. I love yoga, Pilates, walking, dancing, stretching as ways to start to really get in some purposeful movement. There's some great apps and resources. Uh, Tuscaloosa and UA have an abundance of resources in our community um, for wellness and for fitness, and certainly WellBama does as well. So we'd love for you to join some of our programs, but there's so many resources out there that are free or easily accessible. So those are some of my favorites. And then meditation, let your brain rest. Have some quiet time, meditate for three to five minutes. Like I said, use an app if you need to, or listen to music. That's another great thing to do if you aren't really sure about, you know, an app. Uh, those positive affirmations and being present in the moment can help. And then also being mindful of your distractions. And so that's something that you can really focus on. And meditation is really something that you want to work up to having multiple breaks during the day. So you know, five to 10 to 15 minutes in the morning, afternoon, and evening is really optimal because we weren't designed to just hit our alarm buttons, you know, snooze it, wake up for the day, and then go, go, go until we go to sleep at night. And a lot of us put our phones down after we've gone, you know, 16, 18 hours a day of being overstimulated. And then we wonder why we can't fall asleep at night. It's because we really have overdone it and our brains aren't designed like a light switch to just turn the lights out at night. Um, so you do really need to have a nighttime routine to get into good sleep. Reminders, obviously, you know, we have seen an increase this past year in, you know, substance abuse and substance use. And so just a reminder um, that if you are self-medicating, um, you know, with food or alcohol or other things, just to be mindful of your consumption. Um, because sometimes we use these things as a coping strategy that isn't really that helpful and can lead to other challenges. And so definitely think about your consumption of these things and how you want to, you know, manage um, your consumption and your coping strategies moving forward. So I love these images here. They're called Karens. They're stacked stones, and they're a form of art. 
But what I want to show you with this is that every one of these rock stacks are balanced differently. And so finding balance truly does look different for everyone. And what works for me may not work for you. So I really want you to use what I've shown you and talked about in this presentation as a menu of things that you can try. And if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. Then try to pick something else. Um, this isn't a prescription. It truly is a menu for you to choose what works for you. And so this is a toolkit of resources. And again, you know, coming up with an action plan, determining what your needs are, going back to Maslow, thinking about what your values and beliefs are, you know, what's most important to you? What are you trying to achieve? Even crafting a personal mission statement that gives you an idea of what um, you want to achieve in your life. You know, the University of Alabama has some great branding, has a great mission and vision statement. And it's very recognizable. Uh, and we can have that too, because we're a part of that mission, but we also have a personal mission. And then developing a roadmap to resilience. I'm going to show you some tools and resources for that. But I also want to encourage you to just use this as a way to create your own resources and to find your own uh, kind of road to resilience, because it is a personal journey. So core values. These are the things that you could really think about, you know, what is most important to you? Because we probably would say all of these are important, but if you could only pick five or 10 or maybe even three, then that's gonna be harder and that's gonna look different for us. And so these are some of the ones that I circled that are important. Um, it's important that I have purpose. It's important that I pay it forward. My way of paying it forward and having purpose is that I've gone on a really, um, you know, impactful health journey going from having, um, you know, being categorized as morbidly obese to being within a healthy weight and changing my health for the better and changing my family legacy. Giving this, um, you know, type of webinar is my way of paying it forward and serving out that purpose. And so um, practicing gratitude is really important for me. Having grit, being mindful. So your values are really linked to your purpose and meaning and can really help you when you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed to refocus and recenter yourself because it takes you back to why you're doing what you're doing. And that why is going to be so important when you do feel stressed or overwhelmed. So thinking about your personal mission statement. So for me, I put, it is my personal mission statement. It's my personal mission to live each day with curiosity, purpose, and gratitude so I can live my best life and pay it forward. I will do this by prioritizing my health, continuing to learn, and practicing gratitude. So my favorite quote when it comes to this type of thing is by Lewis Carroll when he says, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And so think about it. If you're going to a new place this afternoon, maybe you're going to a new vacation spot this weekend, and you have to put in your GPS information to know how to get to where you're going. You start out by putting where you are. You put your current location and then it maps it to your final destination. And that's what this type of thing is doing. By creating a personal mission statement based off your core values, you're using GPS to get you where you want to go. So what do you want to focus on? What do you want to accomplish? And more importantly, who do you want to become? Because when you make goals to read 100 books this year, you are, you're, you're making an arbitrary goal, and I've done that. I did that this year, and I know, you know, the purpose behind goals. It's not that you read 100 books. That's arbitrary. Your goal is really that you want to become a reader, right? Not that you want to read 100 books. When you say that you want to work out and lift weights, it's not that you want to lift 100 pounds or do, you know, 100 pound weighted squats. It's that you want to become the person who's fit. You want to embody fitness. And so think about your goals in that way and you will feel like you've accomplished more because even if you don't read 100 books, if you read 50 books, you're a reader. If you read five books, you're a reader. Um, you know, same thing with fitness goals. So I think that can be really encouraging for those of you who feel like maybe you haven't reached your goal simply because you didn't meet the full goal. Um, I hope that inspires and encourages you. It, it always is helpful for me because I am very goal and task oriented. So this is a roadmap to resilience and we can provide this to you, but it's one that I created to be able to help you create your personal mission statement, to create your resilient affirmation. I'm resilient because, write down an example when you showed resilience in your personal or your professional life, 
list the things that are important to you. What are some things that you really want to focus on this next year? And you can do that here in this little box. And then pick four that you want to concentrate on. And then when you do that, so maybe your, your value is family. Uh, how are you going to live that value out? Well, maybe your family really values game night. So you follow up with your, your kids or your, your spouse or partner, and you actually do have a game night where you really disconnect and engage with that game. And then write down any roadblocks or limiting beliefs that you have that thinks, you know, you think that might impact your success. And then you might also take time to really write down things that are you're grateful for. Maybe three things that um, you feel gratitude about. And then maybe you have an overall positive affirmation. Because really resilience and becoming your best self is about taking these small actions every day. Persistence and resilience only come from having been given the chance to work through difficult problems. And I fully believe that, y'all. Um, you know, if I could share more of my personal story, you would definitely see that story as a testimony to this quote and to this work that we're doing on resilience. So here are some resources in our resource toolkit, a TED Talk on mindset. This is by Carol DeWick. Uh, she has a great TED Talk and she does a lot of wonderful work as a clinical psychologist on mindset. She also has a book. There's a TED Talk here called How to Make Stress Your Friend by Kelly McGonigal, and she does a lot of work in health psychology. So she's another great resource. A breathing technique video that I think is really helpful for when you're trying to reset after being stressed. Breathing really resets your autonomic nervous system and tells you to calm down. So that can be helpful. Mel Robbins is a well-known speaker and author, and she has a 54321 technique where um, she really counts herself down. It's what we do when we go to get on a roller coaster if we're scared and we're like, okay, I'm going to get on this roller coaster. And you're like, okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm going to get on this roller coaster. That's really her method, but she uses the image of a rocket ship because she was really battling some depression and some major life events and she was staying in bed a lot. And she decided, you know, Mel, it's time to get up. It's time to face the day and try to work through some of her situational depression, which is very different than chemical depression. And so she's like, okay, I'm going to close my eyes and count myself down. and I'm going to blast out of this bed like a rocket ship. And she did that. She changed her life and she wrote a book called The Five Second Rule. And it's a really great resource as well. Some self-care ideas on the go. It's just some more things that I included beyond what I included in the other two slides on coping strategies. So if you want to take a screenshot there, you also are welcome to let us know if you'd like this PowerPoint and we can send that out to you as well. And then some other resources. I think these are some great ones that you can start to think about reading as you want to learn more. And I listed these in no particular order, but I'm always a fan of starting with Brene Brown. I think she does a lot of great work as a social worker around mental health, stress and coping and resilience some other resources, blogs, and websites that might be helpful to you. And then some podcasts that are personal favorites, but there are so many great podcasts. We would need a whole presentation on that. So um, if you all have recommendations or resources, please feel free to share those with me or put those in the chat. Some TED Talks. And then Sal Wakeman does a lot of good work around resilience and she is an HR uh, director and uh, has had a lot of experience in human resources for companies. And so she talks about a variety of topics, but she does like to really talk about resilience. And this is a great video, how to become more resilient. And she has a motto, life's messy, live happy. And then my good friend, Julia Madrid, is a licensed counselor here in town, and she has a principle that she calls on the horizon or the 222 rule. And it's every two weeks go out for the evening, every two months go out for the weekend, and every two years go out for a week. And I say to simplify that, uh, you know, plan something once every three to four months, you know, once a quarter or three to four times a year, have something on the horizon to look forward to. Schedule it in your calendar. It doesn't have to be an expensive vacation. It might be coffee or lunch with a friend. It might be, uh, you know, a massage or, you know, a golf date or, you know, something simple 
or, or something more elaborate, but it's something that really gets you looking forward to the next thing because we're really minded about, you know, having goals and accomplishing things. And when we stop being hopeful, when we stop planning for the future, and then we really can see the effects of that on our stress and our ability to cope with that stress. So I want to encourage you to celebrate your wins. You know, pick one thing and try it out this week. And if you want to let me know how that works for you, please do. I'd love to have any comments, questions, or feedback in the chat. We really do try to tailor these presentations to meet your needs. And we want to make sure that you get your questions answered and the resources that you need. We will probably go over time just a little bit, but I will stay on and answer your questions. But for anyone that needs to go, you will get your credit and um, you can sign off at any point that you need to. We would love for you to follow us on our social media channels. Ashley Bayman is on the call and she does a phenomenal job of managing that for the wellness and work life office. So please follow us there. We do have blogs that I've written on most of the topics that I present on. So there's more information and resources there on the website along with all of the archived webinars. So you will be able to find this on the wellness.ua.edu backslash webinar. Um, it will appear there sometime in the next week. Okay, if you'd like some health and life coaching, we do have appointments available for free as part of your employment benefit. So you can reach out at my email address and I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. So I'm gonna move to the chat and see if we have any questions or comments. All right, thanks for everyone for saying hello. Glad you're having a great week so far. Yes, you can definitely review um, this PowerPoint and presentation and Ashley's put instructions for those of you who would like to request it. And okay, lots of thank yous. Glad this was good information. Good, I'm so glad. Any questions or other feedback before we close out our time together? I'm happy to stay on a few more minutes for y'all to get to answer those questions. All right. Well, seeing none, we'll go ahead and close out today. Thank you again so much for joining us. I hope this was helpful to you on your journey. If you have any questions that come up after our presentation today, please feel free to reach out. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. Take some time to rest and roll tide, y'all.